Hello there, welcome to my channel. My name is Doug and I'm back with another fountain pen review. Today I have a very special fountain pen review for you. It's a vintage pen, so yes, it's over 50, like me. David Mishimura defines a vintage fountain pen as any fountain pen made before 1965, and that certainly includes this vintage Waterman's Taperite Lady Crusader, which was probably made around 1950. This pen was a gift to me from my brother and sister-in-law last Christmas. Some of you may have seen it sitting on my desk for a number of videos. I write with this 72-year-old pen often, and even though it's a relatively small pen, it's surprisingly useful, comfortable, and has a very expressive nib. The Taprite was Waterman's answer to Parker's world-changing fountain pen, the Parker 51 from 1941. Let's take a look at this vintage pen that writes like it was made yesterday, right now. And what I'd like to do today is go over the parts and features of this pen, show some size comparisons, some measurements, and then provide a writing sample. After the writing sample, please stay tuned as I will talk about what I like and what I don't like so much about this fountain pen. First, let's talk Waterman and Parker two companies that were founders in the development of the fountain pen at the turn of the last century. Lewis Waterman was awarded a patent for a three Fisher feed in 1887 and George Parker was awarded his feed patent in 1889. The names of the two men remain today as giants in the development of the modern fountain pen. It's interesting, therefore, that both Waterman and Parker pen companies are now both headquartered in France and belong to the same parent company, Newell Brands, Rubbermaid. In 1941, Parker revolutionized the fountain pen industry by releasing the famous Parker 51. Here's one from the 1950s. The 51 introduced the hooded nib, the collector feed, a slip cap, and a vacuumatic filling system. The 51 was a huge success and Parker continued making them until 1972. Through the early 1950s, the Parker 51 was the pen to have sticking out of your shirt pocket. Very trendy. In fact, people would just buy the caps so they could make it look like they had a 51 in their pockets. And as competition between manufacturers goes, everyone wanted to get on the Parker 51 bandwagon. Waterman jumped on that bandwagon a bit late in 1945 with their line of pens called the Taperite. Instead of going up against Parker's patents for the hooded nib, collector feed, and vacuumatic filling system, Waterman designed a model that had some of the same sleek lines of the 51, but used a modified nib and feed system that they had been producing for decades. The 14 karat gold nib on the Taprite is semi-hooded and has a standard Waterman spoon feed. Plus they developed their own slip cap system for the cap, they called lock slip. They even marketed the difference between the Taprite and the 51, advertising the fact that you can actually see the nib on the Taprite while you write. It took a bit of research to discover the particular model of this pen. Thanks go out to Andrew Timar of the Toronto Pen Club for pointing me to some online resources. And I was able to identify this as a Waterman's Taprite, which it says on the documentation right here, Waterman's Taprite. But this particular model was a Waterman's Taprite Lady Crusader from about 1950. My sister-in-law, Diane, acquired this pen as part of an estate, and it came in this lovely presentation box with the original documentation. The pen looked like it hadn't been used in years and had some small amount of dried ink inside it. I soaked it in water with a drop of dish soap and put it in my ultrasonic cleaner. I never attempted to take the pen to pieces as I was afraid of how brittle this plastic might be after 72 years. But after drying the pen out, I inked it up with Waterman Mysterious Blue and it wrote for the first time with no issues. And it has been writing every day after that since December. Let's look at the documentation for a moment. The first page shows how to operate the lever filler. The second page shows Waterman's long-standing free nib exchange program, which still exists today. When I got this Waterman's Karen, it had a fine nib and I exchanged it for a medium. It was sent back to Paris where Waterman replaced it with a medium nib and sent it back to me all free of charge. 
Round trip was 10 days. The third page has instructions for a Waterman mechanical pencil and various Waterman locations around the world. From Montreal, Toronto, New York, Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, London, and Paris. The fourth page shows us how to use the Waterman lock slip cap with one hand and repeats the filling instructions with an additional suggestion to wait 10 seconds with the nib submerged in the ink. There's also a nice illustration of how to use the Waterman bottle to get the last bits of ink. Waterman's Taparite, the pen you've been waiting for. I certainly waited 72 years. Now let's finally look at this pen. Overall, it is a small pocket style pen. The Crusader itself, the full model, is actually about five and a quarter inches long, whereas the Lady Crusader here is about four and three quarter inches capped. It's almost exactly the same length as my beloved Pilot E95S, but the Pilot becomes significantly longer when posted. The body and section are plastic, and the cap is what Waterman called Lumiloy, which is an anodized aluminum. From the top, we see a small conical finial that holds the tiny clip in place on the cap. The clip is short and has Waterman's stamped into it. I assume the short clip is for ladies to attach to lanyards or necklaces as the standard size Crusader has a regular size clip. The cap is matte aluminum with five bright bands and curves up to here and then is straight to the end. There's a tiny step down from the cap to the blue plastic barrel, which is straight to about the middle where it begins to taper away to a rounded point. The barrel has the lever filler on one side and Waterman's made in Canada hot stamped into the other. The lever filler works by lifting that lever, which presses down on a pressure bar, which squeezes a rubber sack on the inside of the pen. And when you bring the lever back down again, the rubber expands and sucks up ink. Vintage lever fillers often need to have the sack replaced and the pen can be disassembled for that purpose. Fortunately, I didn't need to do that with this pen as it continues to work flawlessly and holds about 1.1 milliliter of ink. The cap slips off easily to reveal a long tapering plastic section and the semi-hooded 14 karat gold fine nib. The lock slip cap clutch, boy, say that 10 times fast. <clears throat> is similar to the one used by Parker in the 51, but the Waterman snaps closed with this ring engaging a groove on the inside of the cap. So it slips on and then you hear that click. The section is long and slender and similar to the hood on the 51, but the Waterman is teardrop shaped. It's pointed at the top and rounded at the bottom, which you can see by looking end on at the nib. You can see that pointed ridge right there and the teardrop shape underneath. Let's take a closer look at this nib. It isn't a hooded nib as you can see, but semi hooded with about half of the nib visible. There are no visible markings on the nib, but I assume that there is a hallmark of some kind inside that indicates this is 14 karat gold. You can tell that the nib isn't steel by putting a magnet on it. There is no attraction there at all. The section does not come apart, but can be disassembled as it is probably shellacked in place. The inside of the cap shows a black plastic cap liner and the clutch and groove that make up the lock safe capping mechanism. The cap posts deeply and securely and makes it a nicely balanced and although very slim, it is plenty long enough when posted. Unposted, the pen borders on being too short to write with, but it's possible. When sold in 1950, these tap rights were around $5. In today's dollars, that would be $58 US. Now let's look at some size comparisons. Here we are with the 1950 Waterman's Taparite Lady Crusader with a Pilot E95S, a Caveco Sport, a Magon RS1, and a Pilot Metropolitan for scale. Now let's look at them posted. And here they are posted. The Pilot and the Waterman are both 14 karat gold nibs. And as you can see, the Pilot becomes a much more normal size pen when it's posted, whereas the Waterman remains 
fairly small, but about the size of the Caveco Sport. Now let's look at them unposted. And here they are unposted. I don't think any of these pens, with the exception of the Metropolitan, are designed to be used unposted. And you can see that the Waterman is still a little bit bigger than the Caveco Sport when unposted. Now let's look at some measurements and I'll be back with a writing sample. And we're back with the writing portion of the review. This is Clairefontaine 90 GSM paper. And this is the Waterman. Taparite. Lady. Crusader. And it has a 14 karat gold, what I'm going to call a fine nib. It isn't marked, but that's my guess. Let's check the wetness. It is decently wet for a fine nib. I'm very impressed with how this nib behaves. It's very wet and has a lot of bounce to it. The nib is very smooth and has a good amount of feedback, which is that pencil-like feel of the nib on paper. What really intrigues me about this nib is how it creates character and line variation without any pressure. So this is no pressure at all. And so look at those squiggles. That's no pressure, just the weight of the pen on the page. And the upstrokes are thin and the downstrokes are slightly thicker. Very interesting, no pressure at all. In fact, the lighter the touch, the more flare you get from your writing. So it's changed my writing style quite a bit. And not just because it's a lady pen. So it almost forces some flair to your writing, and I've been enjoying it very much, writing with it constantly since December. And the ink here is, of course, Waterman Mysterious Blue. Waterman Serenity and Mysterious Blue inks are generally known to be among the safest inks for vintage pens. So even if this was not a Waterman, but a 72-year-old rubber sack, I'd put Waterman ink into it. And here are some close matches to this ink from Inkswatch.com. And as to pressure line variation, well, there is some. Oops, I'm re-eroding a bit. There we go. There we go. The nib was drying out as I've been talking. But you can see with some pressure, you do get some line variation. This nib makes a horizontal 0.5 millimeter line and a 0.6 millimeter vertical line, which makes it sit between a Western fine and a Western medium or a Japanese medium. So the line is subtly stub-like. You can see that vertical line is a little bit thicker than the horizontal line, which is what gives it that thicker line on the downstrokes. I'm using no pressure whatsoever here. Uh, and so it's giving me some sort of natural line variation. Very, very interesting. These nibs were uh, hand ground by Waterman back in the day. So the horizontal line is 0 0.5 millimeters. And the vertical lines are 0 0.6 millimeters. 
This is a good moment to introduce a new feature here on Inquiring Minds, Doug's Mailbag. Doug's Mailbag. Now and then I'll dip into my saved mailbag of comments to share with y'all some particularly noteworthy comments from viewers just like you. Well, not so much. Since most of you are kind and supportive and just, well, you can stand erect. Today's featured comment comes from Gina Ishivitov, but Gina was kind enough to comment this. The Japanese do not have size XF. Write correctly. Do not use American templates everywhere. Thank you for your kind and generous comment, Gina. I see you have 38 subscribers on your YouTube channel after 5 years and 24 videos. Keep up the good work and keep those cards and letters coming. My answer was this. Calm down. I'm using Richard Bender's Pens That Write Write Stroke Width Chart. Richard is a world authority on fountain pens. Besides, I'm giving the actual metric measurements of the nib, so you can call it Fred if you like. And it doesn't change the fact that it's a 0.3 millimeter tip. And here is a print of Richard's stroke width chart. I'll put a link to this document in the description below. It's always nice to have an expert with you. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. Let me, let me come over here a second. Oh, tell I heard, him. I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong. Boy, if life were only like this. So when I say this is a Western fine or a Japanese extra fine, I'm going to Richard's chart, you see. And I give you the actual line width in millimeters. And you can call a 0.3 millimeter line fine, broad, or Gina. So it doesn't really matter what you call it. 0.3 millimeters is a 0.3 millimeters in all universes. So if you want to be featured on the next installment of Doug's Mailbag, Doug's Mailbag, be sure to leave an obnoxious comment below and I'll try to squeeze you in. From now on, if you want to tweet something, you do it the old-fashioned way. Write it on a piece of paper, staple it to a bird, and throw it out the door. Hey, do you follow Peter Griffin on Twitter? No. Why? Is he funny? No, he just throws dead birds on his lawn. It's awesome. And for our quote. And for some reverse writing. It's much drier, but not significantly scratchy. And some quick writing. No issues whatsoever. And that's coming out nicely wet. So, what do I like and what do I not like about this pen? Well, I love everything about this pen. It was a gift from my brother and sister-in-law, so it will be cherished. It's old and is made in Canada, just like me. It tells a story of another age when men had their own Schaefer pen for men and women had their own Lady Crusader. Nowadays, a politically correct pen would be a uniball pen for all. Here's another who single-handedly started the hashtags that canceled 12 network TV shows she found offensive. And now I'm told she identifies as a man, so I'm being fired. Hello, I'm your new announcer. And actually, he was just about done. Thank you and good day. Seriously, today anyone can use a Lady Crusader or a PFM. When I was in grade one, the teacher went around the room and asked everyone what their favorite color was. When my turn came, I said pink, because pink was my favorite color. Blasphemer! The laughter and snickering I got for liking a girl's color embarrassed me for life and had me changing my preferences because I didn't want to be stuffed into lockers. Hello! Hello! Anybody? It doesn't smell good in here. Today we can have our own preferences without risk of ridicule, right? Eh, not so much. Recently I was told that my affection for this Leonardo Ferrore in white with gold trim was me liking a girly pen. Don't be economic girly man. <laughs> but alas, the girly man is a formidable opponent. That's right. But the difference today is 
I don't give a f I like it. And I like this Lady Crusader and my girly Pilot E95S in champagne gold too. Although I'm not a manly man, I'm not a girly man either. I'm right in the middle. I'm what you might call a manly girly man. <laughs> Sue me, but don't call me Sue. And if I ever have a boy, I think I'm going to name him Bill or George, anything but Sue. I still hate that name. And there you have it. Thanks go out to Bob and Diane, of course, for the lovely and thoughtful gift. And also thank you to Andrew Timar of the Toronto Fountain Pen Club for his help in identifying the name and model of this pen. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that bell to get instant notifications whenever a new video is posted. And you can join as a member of my channel too for only 99 cents a month. I guarantee I will answer your comments in the comments section. I might even feature some of them and you'll get cool emojis and badges. Plus now I'm providing unboxing videos as I get new pens exclusively for members only. And that just leaves it for me to say... Thank you for watching and that's all she wrote.